So, uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, I apologize for a smaller than usual venue, but the, the 218 room downstairs uh, is a class, and because our seminars are Mondays, and this is a Wednesday, we didn't have the room. So bear with me. And um, if need be, then we'll bring some more chairs. There are more chairs in the lounge. So I'm really uh, delighted to have Andrew uh, McKellick uh, with us today. Andrew is a distinguished professor at uh, UCSD in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, Bioengineering, I think it's called, with medicine. And uh, he was the chair of the department for three years, I think, 2005, something like that. Yeah. He was the ch chair of that department. Um, and you actually been UCSD now for 30 years or so. And that's almost, we probably know each other for that long. <laughs> um, <coughs> Andrew received his PhD uh, in Auckland under the uh, supervision and guidance of uh, those of you who know, Professor Peter Hunter who's uh, still in Auckland, and has done uh, some seminal work on uh, biomechanics in general, but in particular, our interest is in the heart, and Andrew uh, has addressed it too. I think what's um, unique in, in, in his work uh, in some ways is the combination of experiments, mostly in, uh, in uh, genetically engineered mice, with computations and with uh, extensive computation to try and understand mechanism, and importantly, to try and integrate from the small to the large. And um, we call it now systems biology, but we've been doing system biology before the name was invest invented. And the idea is to start from now molecular structure of uh, subcellular um, uh, regions and, and, and structures all the way, in the case of the heart, to the whole heart to try and understand the underlying mechanisms of, in our case, atrial, atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. It could be arrhythmias, it could be mechanical. Um, properties of the whole heart. So there are many more things to say about what uh, Andrew has done, but I'll let him speak instead of taking the time. Uh, so thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Sharon. It's a pleasure to be here. Actually, to be back here, I think this is the third time I've given a seminar here, and uh, I feel like I have a special affinity with uh, Washington University. In fact, there are two faculty members sitting here who have both spent time in my laboratory when they were undergrads. Um, so um, we I appreciate this opportunity to come back and see all the changes and new faces. But I, you know, the last time I was here was exactly three years ago. And then I did talk a lot about some of those things about multi scale modeling and gene targeted mouse models of heart failure. And then I all that. I look back at that seminar, and it's like this frenetic seminar, there's three different mouse models, and then I decided to throw in something about humans yeah. as well. I was like, oh, what am I going to talk about this time? So this time I'm not going to talk about heart failure. In fact, I'm not sure that anything I'm going to talk about even relates to a disease. You may have some ideas. And right at the end, there's a little bit about LQT, but for the most part, this is sort of more basic little study that's been done, bubbling along in my lab that um, I thought might um, you know, uh, provoke some discussion and, and, and be of interest. So, um, so let me get started here. So the uh, topic is cardiac mechanoelectric feedback, which is something we've been interested in in my lab, sort of as a sort of a side project for quite a long time. Um, and particularly the possibility that there may be a role for cavioli in this process. So. Mechanoelectric feedback is the sort of uh, poor uh, step sister or whatever to um, excitation contraction coupling that gets all the attention. Um, but it's not only the case that 
uh, electrical activity in cardiac myocytes stimulates mechanical protraction, but the mechanical stimuli modulate the electrophysiological responses of the myocyte. And um, this could be very important because um, there is an increased incidence of sudden cardiac death and a life-threatening arrhythmia in uh, pathologies such as congestive heart failure and uh, coronary artery disease that involve alterations, specifically increases in regional myocardial wall stress and strain. Um, strain in a normal myocyte tends to prolong the action potential and therefore non-homogeneous strain, strain that's different in different parts of the wall, which is also another characteristic of the diseased heart tends to increase the dispersion of repolarization, and so this could create a pro-rhythmic substrate. And um, some of the earliest observations on mechanoelectric feedback looked at how just a transient stretch can actually depolarize the membrane enough to trigger uh, uh, impulses. So here, for example, Michael Franz did this experiment in the uh, rabbit heart where they just pulse the volume, and you can see that if they pulse it frequently enough, they can actually essentially pace the rabbit heart with volume pulses. And um, here's an old study in dogs showing that you know, a um, volume pulse in the dog heart can actually induce arrhythmias, uh, and that the probability of inducing an arrhythmia with the volume pulse is significantly higher in a canine model of heart failure. So um, there are three main classes of mechanism that have been described in the cardiac mechanoelectric feedback world. So the main one that most people study is stretch activated ion channels. And I think progress in this field has been hard because these channels are often very hard to clone and hard to access with a patch pipe bit and um, difficult to study. And also I think the more we learn, the more we find that more channels are in fact mechanosensitive to some extent. And then on top of that, Mechanics isn't like a ligand where you just change the dose. There are lots of different mechanical stimuli. Um, and so it's hard to study these different types of mechanical stimulus, whether it's a uniaxial strain or a biaxial strain, a static or a dynamic a shear or a tension or a compression. So um, nevertheless, the main uh, uh, progress that's been made in understanding mechanoelectric feedback in how is um, on studies of um, mechanics-sensitive ion channels. Um, then, um, it's in the same way that calcium mediates EC coupling, calcium can also re mediate reverse EC coupling in various ways, and um, so mechanical modulation of intracellular calcium um, is a second actually class of mechanism, not a single mechanism, um, whereby uh, a mechanical stimulus can alter the action potential. And, um, you know, perhaps the the best known is that a transient stretch that's sufficient to detach cross bridges will thereby change the affinity for calcium of the thin filament and then some calcium can come off the thin filament. And it might seem like a little puff, but because the thin filaments are such a big buffer of calcium and a dynamic buffer of calcium, calcium those that can, under certain circumstances, trigger uh, pro-arrhythmic events like uh, intracellular and even intercellular calcium waves. We tend to do a lot of work on that. And then much more recently, John Lederer's lab um, described a uh, XROS mediated mechanism for stretch-induced calcium release from IP3 receptor stores. And so um, there's, there's a whole other world of can can electric feedback that is calcium centric. And then there's this other little world that has not had much attention at all, um, which is how stress or, uh, and or strain in the uh, myocyte or the tissue can affect the conduction velocity, action potential propagation velocity. And one of the main problems with this area is that there's about equal numbers of studies, maybe nowadays a few more in this category, that, but when we started on this, there were pretty much equal numbers of studies that said that if you stretch a myocyte or a heart preparation, there's no effect on conduction velocity. If you uh, stretch it, the conduction velocity increases, or if you stretch it, the conduction velocity decreases. And so that was a little bit of a, um, 
confounding issue that made us think we need to study this in a little more detail when we first stepped that into this. Um, so actually, when we first did this, we did a rabbit heart and a Langendorf rabbit heart preparation. Um, but this is actually data from the mouse, and the data I'll show you today is from the mouse. Um, so we have uh, an isolated Langendorf perfused, uh, now um, working mouse heart, a freely beating mouse heart. We used to do it in a, a Langendorf with a balloon preparation. Um, but by doing some, uh, and, and the reason, one of the reasons for that is that we didn't want the heart to move, and so we decoupled it. But in subsequent iterations of this technique, we were able to use some motion correction and, um, and uh, uh, other techniques in order to allow this heart to actually beat. And while it's diffused inside an optical chamber, and then we uh, illuminate it and image it with a high-speed CMOS camera while it's loaded with uh, the voltage-sensitive dye, dye from NIPS. And then we can adjust the uh, filling pressure on the left ventricle between 0 and 30 millimeters of mercury. And we normally, most of the measurements we would make, because this is epicardial imaging, and we really want to see, we would pace near the apex here, and so you would see this uh, epicardial uh, propagation pattern. And so, yeah. once you have this preparation stable, all you have to do is raise the pressure, and then uh, within a minute, the conduction velocity, whether measured in the sort of the long axis of the elliptical activation isochrones, which is roughly the epicardial fiber orientation, um, or transversely, uh, decreased by about 20%. And this is a result we, this is again data from the mouse, but a result that we first described in the rabbit heart. It was almost identical data to the rabbit. So this, this was an easy experiment to do, but a hard experiment to defend, because there are all kinds of possible artifacts that could have been contributing to this. And I nearly forgot to put this slide in because it was so long ago, but then I realized that the main and when you say uh, conduction relative max and mean, this is an isotropic conduction? And isotropic, so this is, this is the of the along the principal axis. Yeah, so the ratio and that you have is 2 to 1. Right? Around 2 to 1, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, this you have to take into account this isn't a perfect, this isn't two-dimensional preparation. So these um, uh, wave fronts that you see here are also a reflection of fibers that are not on the epicardium and have a different orientation. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit, a bit complicated. <coughs> but it actually turned out that this particular fact didn't matter which direction we measured the propagation in, and it, later you'll see it also didn't matter which direction we loaded the tissue in. So it's the anisotropy of the problem we ended up sort of ignoring. But, I, you know, you can see it was a while ago, but um, the, there were a lot of questions that came up about this. So what about, you know, were we making the, by increasing the load, were we making preparation ischemic, ischemic and then decoupling uh, cells? And so we had to, you know, vary our perfusion um, to test whether this could be an ischemia response to rule that out. Um, was it a function of the electromechanical decoupler? The first time we did this, we used, had to use electromechanical decouplers. Um, and so then we had to come up with uh, methods for measuring this in a freely beating heart. And again, the, the presence of the uh, what we were using BDN at the time didn't make a difference. Was it the dye? Right. So then we had to do, set up some electrodes and do it without the dye. And again, we found the same thing. Was the temperature actually the temperature? You know, when you increase the load and decrease the perfusion a little bit, the temperature actually drops a wee bit, so then we have to superfuse the epicardium and control the temperature, and again, it turned out not to be that. And so we, you know, with more work than it might sound, uh, we had to address these artifacts, but then the real the question came up, well, is this actually a myocyte stress-dependent response, or is this some other tissue uh, phenomenon? Maybe it doesn't involve myocytes, maybe the fibroblast media response. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we did was try to recapitulate this in vitro uh, using micro-patterned uh, neonatal mouse ventricular myocytes. So the micro-patterning is done on a PDMS membrane um, using um, microlithography 
where we make these little channels that are 10 microns wide, 5 microns deep, and 10 microns apart. And then um, you saw that little confocal stack of the cells. They sort of lay down in the neonatal mouse myocytes, lay down in those channels, and then they sort of bulge up out of them. And um, so the preparation ends up being coupled um, transversely and longitudinally. Um, the expression of gap junctions is, looks fairly normal. The aspect ratio of the cells is fairly normal. And perhaps more importantly, the conduction velocity and the anisotropy of the conduction were fairly representative of what we see in the end cat um, And then we can take these membranes and put them on these uh, stretch devices that are actually elliptical, uh, which means that, so if you think about this, this is like a little drum, so there's an O-ring that holds the, um, the membrane uh, in the stretcher here, and then you put this little indented down and then you screw it, and as you do that, it's just like tightening a drum. Um, but if you think about what you're actually doing is you're displacing this uh, indenter equally in all directions, which means that the strain that you induce is actually higher in this direction than this direction, because you're displacing it, you're stretching it the same amount this way as this way in displacement, but the denominator is about half or third in this direction. So we end up um, inducing a non equibiaxial strain, which actually typical and representative of what you'd see on the epicardium or the endocardium. The difference being on the endocardium, actually, uh, most of the strain would actually be transverse, but mostly in the crossfire direction. In the epicardium, it's the direction of maximum strain is actually on the epicardial fiber direction, on the fiber direction. And so, we, depending on whether you lined up this uh, micro pattern uh, culture um, transverse to or longitudinal to the indenter, you could either stretch the cells primarily longitudinally or primarily transversely. Uh, and then we actually, the first time we did this, we did it with Leslie Tung at Hopkins. Uh, this is actually a video that came from his lab before we uh, managed to get our optical mapping system set up to be able to do it um, in our lab. Um, and you can see already the very first experiment we did with them that uh, stretching um, by, I think it was 14% um, in one direction, and actually I think this was actually a biaxial stretch experiment. But anyway, stretching uh, by uh, about 10% was insufficient to um, slow the conduction and turned out to be about the same amount that we saw when we loaded the intact car to about 30 millimeters of mercury. And so, um, so here you actually see the data. This is a function of the maximum principal strain, and this is when the direction of that maximum principal strain is along the fiber direction. In other words, the, the membrane is aligned this way, so that this direction is getting stretched most, the cells are getting stretched um, primarily in the fiber direction by about a three to one ratio. And then this um, represents the longitudinal conduction velocity and the transverse conduction velocity relative to the unstretched control 100% here. And here's the same experiment, but this time when the direction of maximum stretch is actually transverse to the cells. And so, you know, in some ways the unexciting thing about this experiment is there was no effect either of the orientation of the maximum stretch or on uh, either component to maximum or minimum component of the anisotropic conduction. But um, we did see uh, something that could help might help explain some of the conflicting literature because you see actually the strains below 5%, whether they were, whether that was in the fiber direction or the cross fiber direction, uh, you actually get a significant increase in conduction velocity, right? about 25% increase. And then very rapidly, as the strain exceeds 5%, you start to get a decrease to about the uh, 20 25% reduction, more consistent with what we were seeing in the intact heart. Um, so this, um, we, most of the rest of the data I'll show you is at this point because we were interested in the Sloan, but I think that this um, may explain quite a bit, of, and then in fact other people like Frank Sachs and Utah have seen um, this similar sort of biphasic type of response to strain. Yeah. Do you know if the cells are hypertrophying in response to the strain? You know, we, even when we try to make the cells hypertrophy in response to stretch, we haven't been, it's hard to see that. And probably the best way you can see it and this, by the way, is within a few minutes. 
so the, the answer is no. But uh, if we do, if you stretch these cells for a few hours, then after about six hours, um, the, the best way that we can sort of deduce the presence of hypertrophy in this preparation is by measuring the sarcomere length. And so the sarcomere length will increase acutely by however much you stretch in the fiber direction. If you stretch 10%, the sarcomere length will increase 10%. But then six hours later, it will have gone back to normal. And as far as we can tell, that's because of the serious addition of new sarcomeres, not to some sort of adhesive response where the cells type of detach and, and sort of relieve the strain. But it's actually quite, you can induce hypertrophic markers <coughs> within 30 minutes in these cells, but it's actually very hard to show that they're actually hypertrophy in the time scale of these types of experiments. If you leave them for days, then you know, it's, it's possible to, um, but they actually don't want hypertrophy that much. Um, so the, the, the stretch that you apply, um, how does it compare to the whole chicory? Right, so it's 13, I think it was 3.6% and 13%, I forget the numbers exactly, something like that is the, the standard when we do two turns of the stretcher, that's what we get. And that is comparable to the strain that you would get if you went from, 30, from zero to 30 millimeters of mercury. Now, in vivo, that's not gonna happen. However, it's probably not completely different from if you went from, uh, you know, it's in the same order of magnitude as if you went from sort of physiological 10 millimeters of mercury, say, to failing 30 millimeters of mercury. Or if you went from um, uh, early, uh, from diastole or diastasis through to, so that in terms of the physiological swing during the cardiac cycle of strain, it's very representative of what you'd see on the epicardium in that isolated heart preparation. In terms of the change that you might see, that's, that's probably a little harder to interpret, but I think of it as being similar to the difference between the strain you might see on the epicardium in a you know, normal hemodynamic heart versus one that was acutely fed. And this is a static stretch. This is static. So it's static yes. stretch. Yes. You don't do this like Andre and, no. uh, and Jeff do. No. In the past, we have looked at, we've even sort of made a version of this preparation that dynamically stretches the um, cells. And for longer term experiments, like some of these ones on hypertrophy, that is mostly useful since it seems to sort of remind the cells of the stimulus because they tend to forget after a while. But there don't seem to be very many very systematic differences between stretch versus cyclic stretch. It's just cyclic, it's just a way of sort of ramping up the effect of the stretch. At least that's my, but in this case, this is an acute thing, and this is within a couple of minutes. Um, certainly within five minutes that we're making these. And so here again, side by side, you know, you see that the changes in uh, activation time of conduction velocity seen in vitro and in vivo were about the same magnitude for about the same magnitude of strain. In fact, for the microcat myocytes, this, I think this uh, average here was, let's see, let's see um, this was 26%, doesn't really look like it, um, and whoops. And um, I think the other was about 19% at the average for that, for the epicardium. And the strains on average would be a little bit higher in the in vitro preparation, so I think it would make sense. So then the question was, well, what could be explaining this? Um, what are the acute things that would control conduction velocity? And of course, there are many specific parameters, but in generally, I think you could classify them as two. Okay. Either, and in fact, Robin Shaw and Joram wrote this sort of seminal article that made me appreciate the difference between slowing conduction by decreasing membrane excitability and slowing conduction by decreasing coupling, which is the safety factor. And when you decrease excitability, the safety factor actually goes down for conduction. You're less likely, you're more likely to block. When you decrease coupling, you're actually less likely to block. Um, but we didn't actually look at that. However, um, roughly speaking, like this experiment from uh, Stephen Rohr shows you if you, you, if you uh, depolarize the membrane by change, but increasing uh, extracellular potassium, that you can slow conduction. And that this relationship, sort of, I 
understand this relationship as a sort of a reflection of the effects of excitability into the certain channel activation on memory and excitability. Whereas if you, I think the study was uh, using heptanol to decouple gap junctions, uh, of the more you decouple gap junctions, the slower conduction, but you can make conduction go much slower without blocking. So roughly speaking, this, the first thing we needed to figure out before we went any further, is this a, an effect of membrane excitability or is this an effect of the electrical properties of the tissue, um, or both? Um, and so actually, I, one way, way we thought of doing this was actually just to replicate that experiment of Stephen Rawls. And see, the interesting thing is that when you stretch, the uh, relationship between uh, extracellular potassium concentration and conduction velocity simply goes down. It doesn't shift to the left or right. So this was a kind of a, a crude way of suggesting that maybe this is not a change in excitability, but rather a change that was independent of membrane excitability. I'm not sure if you agree with that interpretation, but you see this was a while ago we did this experiment. And I actually wanted to do the, the safety factor experiment. Um, another thing we did was uh, block stretch activated ion channels so uh, we used both gadolinium and um, um, Fred Sachs's um, peptide, uh, GSMTX4. Uh, and you can see that neither, this is compared with stretched over unstretched, uh, and you can see that um, neither gadolinium nor uh, GSMTX4 blockade or stretch activated ion currents. So we also used streptomycin in some experiments. Uh, had any effect on this conduction slowing. But just to make sure it was working, they did have an effect on action potential duration. Um, so the prolongation of the action potential that occurs with stretch in our preparation is blocked with gadolinium in the, in the heart. So then we thought, well, okay, so maybe if this isn't a membrane excitability property could this be a electrical property of the tissue, not knowing which electrical property to look at. And so one way that we could do that is to apply a subthreshold stimulus in the mapping system and then measure the decay of the signal and use that to measure a spatial space and time constants of that decay uh, as sort of macroscopic indicators of the tissue resistance and capacitance. <coughs> which you could compute from these measurements with a little bit of simple modeling. And actually, to our surprise, they both went up. So in fact, the space constant increased about 20%, which actually suggests the um, membrane resistance was decreasing, which probably wouldn't explain any uh, conduction slowing. But the time constant increased even more, actually increased 60% which was very unexpected. Uh, however, you put these two together into a simple sort of one-dimensional bi-domain model, and you will predict exactly the 15 to 20% conduction slope. So these measurements, if nothing else, are consistent. You know, it's, we haven't looked at it as a function of strain, but it's quite possible that these two processes are uncoupled, and maybe you know, this happens before this, we have reason to think that could be the case, which might, so it could be that these changes are also explaining the increase in conduction velocity that are seen for small strains. So you, so, so, so you said before that potassium was extracellular potassium was constant. Well, the effect of extracellular, changing extracellular potassium was constant. So was this like the determinant of membrane excitability and how you elevate the test potential, which is basically the term. Right. Right. That's why you have the initial increase. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. That's determined by the interstitial concentration. Yes. Of potassium. Mm -hmm. When you stretch, you change the volume there. Right. You change the yeah. concentration. Now, it's true, and that, this is one of the other reasons why we did the in vitro system. Because quite when we first published this, actually before we did those in vitro studies, and one of the comments was, well, how do you know this isn't an interesting? I think it was, it was actually at one of those NBC meetings in Oxford that that comment was made. I think it was that they believe So yeah, I, you're right. And nothing about this actually rules any of that out. I think being able to recapitulate some of this, as you'll see, 
in the vitro system may go some way towards explaining that. Maybe. So the natural interpretation for the change in the time constant is a change in membrane capacitance, though it seems a little remarkable that the membrane capacitance could really be changing on the order of 50 to 100 percent. However, there have actually been um, some previous studies in other cell types showing that stretch of epithelial cells and uh, astrocytes does actually significantly increase uh, membrane capacitance in these preparations. Um, so we thought it might be worth um, measuring, and so Andy, when Andy Edwards was in my lab, um, we patched these cells, we grew these cells subconfluent on the stretches, these are neonatal myocytes, um, and we patched them and measured the membrane capacitance directly, you know, as close to directly as you can, uh, the various holding potential steps. And you can see this is 14% maximum principal strain, and the other direction was about 3.6% 3 and, 3 and on the non-equal bikes of stretcher. Actually doubled the membrane capacitance as measured in the um, So that's where we really focused on this change of membrane capacitance as a possible mechanism of the conducting slowing. This is, this is the membrane capacitance of the cell? Of the cell. Of the whole cell. This is of a, a whole of a whole uh, my, the neonatal mouse ventricular cell. Single cell. Yeah, single cell. So these were subconfluent, they weren't coupled. But they were adhered, so we were using the same stretch mechanism, but it's actually a different preparation. So do you know if the um, potassium uh, current density changed? <coughs> the, you know, so was it like a physiologic or pathologic hypertrophy type of situation? You know, I mean, I know it's not hypertrophy, but you know, when you have increased capacitance, you would expect it. Well, maybe it did. Um, we don't know. Again, this happened very quickly, but poten you know, potentially the mechanism that I'm going to talk about could also have a significant effect on ion channel densities, and that could be contributing to this change in uh, membrane resistance as well. And so this, that whole part of the story, I don't really know what the answer is, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on it. So as I'm sure you know, cavioli are uh, specialized lipid rafts in the membrane that are uh, flask-shaped invaginations or <coughs> round vesicles in the cytosol. Um, they're rich in cholesterol, phospho-sphingolipid, scaffolding protein, the caviolins, and lots of signaling molecules and ion channels. And they tend to be transient type of structures. Um, and Peter Cole had observed in the rabbit heart that when you inflated and fixed the rabbit heart and did in, that the number of cavioli seen in the membrane <coughs> seemed to decrease, but in particular, um, subsarcolemal cavioli tended to open up to the membrane, and maybe open cavioli in the membrane tended to disappear. And this is a sort of fairly descriptive, but he thought quite um, you know, illuminating paper. Uh, and in fact, um, there was another study that came out a bit later um, using uh, HeLa cells uh, in which they both stretched the cells and, provide, and subjected them to osmotic swelling. Um, and they saw that the number of cavioli decreased. And they specifically attributed this um, through some quite nice um, turf type imaging experiments to the idea that when you reach a critical strain, the ruffles and invaginations in the membrane disappear and the membrane becomes straight. And if that leads to a burst in tension, that is then the stimulus for the recruitment of cavioli to the membrane as a protective mechanism. Um, so in cardiac myocytes, um, the caviolin that's primarily uh, responsible for scaffolding uh, the uh, cavioli is CAV3. Uh, it interacts with the dystrophin like the protein complex members. Uh, it's important in um, developing T-tubule system. Um, 
mutations in CAV3 are um, associated with various cardiomyopathies and arrhythmias, um, including hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, CAV3 is downregulated in several models of cardiac hypertrophy, and actually upregulation of CAV3 may be a, a protective against cardiac aging. And the CAV3 knockout mouse, which was uh, developed independently in a couple of labs, including by our collaborators, um, Himal Patel and Dave Rock, developed um, cardiomyopathic phenotype. Um, but when they're young, they have no um, heart failure phenotype. And so we used uh, young CAV3 knockout mice uh, in our studies. So these, the CAV3 knockout mice essentially have, they have um, cavioli in their fibroblasts but not in the myocytes. They're essentially gone. And so here's a wild type mouse who UL is unloaded. And then when we load, uh, you can see that the number of cavioli decreases, uh, both the closed subcyclinemal cavioli and the open uh, cavioli. And that the CAV3 knockout mouse has none. And we can also get rid of most, not all of them, with treatment with methylbetacyclodextran, which is a common intervention for depleting cholesterol. Uh, and so you can see that there's this little bit of a tendency for the number of, total number of cavioli to decrease with load. There's hardly any in the knockouts. And in the methyl beta cycle of dextran treated, there's a lot fewer, but it still decreases significantly. Yeah. Has anyone ever looked at Duchenne's patients to see whether there are any differences if you're disrupting this stroke and complex? Oh. Not that I know of with this particular sort of preparation, but yeah, I mean, I know there's a lot of work on uh, membrane integrity and Duchenne, and things would be nice on this. Both in skeletal land, looking yes, at yeah. uh, cardiomyopathy things that are typically associated with. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a CAT3 interacting effect in those, uh, those patients or their mouse models. Um, so, this is actually uh, from the micropat neonatal ventricular myocytes. Before we get too far on this, we want to make sure that these cells actually have cavioli. In fact, they even have um, immature T-tubules, which surprised us. So, uh, but here you can see that the distribution of the subsacralemal and integral cavioli was also uh, similar, and certainly they're evident uh, in the micropatin cells, just as they were in the tissue from the intact heart. And so if we separated out the subsacralemal from the sacralemal uh, cavioli and counted them as a function of load and treatment, uh, you can see now there's actually quite a clear significant decrease that's reversible with load. So within a few minutes, the number of subsacralemal cavioli decreases significantly. The number of total decreases but not as prominently. And then you uh, unload again and they come back within a few minutes, both in the isolated cells and in the fake heart tissue. And again, as I showed before, uh, we decrease the total number in the knockouts and the methyl beta cyclodextran treated cells. So, what happens to the conduction velocity um, when in these models? Um, now, interestingly, the baseline is a little bit different for the micropatin and the CAF, not, micropatin CAF3 knockout myocytes and the animal model. And this could be, we think, because cholesterol can be sort of recruited from the circulating pool in vivo, whereas in the isolated cells they don't have that source. So we don't really know. But perhaps more importantly, um, in either system, the stretch dependent decrease in, uh, with, uh, in production velocity is almost completely lost. And the same uh, in the isolated heart with the treatment with methyl beta cyclic extreme. Um, I think we could do it in the myocytes because it affected the dying. Um, so this suggests that um, the stretch dependent conduction slowing that I've showed you requires cavioli. Um, and again, we found that this effect was not uh, affected by um, GSMTX4 um, 
the stream check query channel buffer. Anything else I should show you there? Oh, this shows the, set, the membrane capacitance and actually the time constant um, from our measurements in the isolated cells from the patch pipe data. And here you can see that uh, compared with the wild types where I showed you there was a big increase in membrane capacitance that's unaffected by stretch activated channel blockade, that was in, uh, attenuated by methyl beta cyclodextran, which partially but not completely uh, eliminated the cavioli and was uh, completely abrogated in the CAD3 knockouts. And interestingly, this difference was even more pronounced when you calculated the time constant. Um, so somehow there's some changes in membrane uh, resistance as well, and you put it together, and the time constant affects a complete of uh, floating are completely lost in the knockouts in the methyl beta cyclodextran treated cells. So that paper I showed you before, um, where they looked at the HeLa cells and uh, the caviola conformation with stretch and osmotic swelling, proposed that the cavioli acted as mechanosensors, uh, and particularly that uh, when the membrane tension, when the folds in the membrane were removed, and so then the tension was felt in the membrane, um, that the uh, Cavioli were rapidly recruited as a protective mechanism. And so we thought, well, if this is true, then we should be reaching the point where we're unfolding the folds in the myocyte membrane uh, in both preparations. And so here's what the myocyte membrane looked like at rest. Uh, and so one way you can measure this sort of torturosity by measuring the sort of end-to-end -end length versus the uh, membrane length, and that ratio, if it's greater than one, suggests that there's folds in the uh, membrane, and um, although it's a two-dimensional measurement, so it's not perfect, essentially if that ratio gets close to one, that means that we've straightened out these folds. And you can see that um, the loading does in fact almost straighten out the membrane, um, and that's reversible. Um, and that happens um, with the treatment as well. So this sort of suggests that the loads that we're applying both to the cells and the tissue are sufficient to um, potentially um, you know, activate this mechanism. And so finally what we did is we um, used a lipophilic dye, incubated the cells with this, but this dye only fluoresces when it's in the bilayer. And uh, here's what happens um, when you stretch that uh, the wild type preparation, these are the isolated cells, you get a big increase in the signal as the dye that's been loaded into the subsarcal emol vesicles but isn't um, fluorescing comes to the membrane and to the plasma membrane and um, that effect is completely lost in the cancer knockout. And interestingly, the magnitude of this change is almost the same as the magnitude of the change in the capacitance. Um, the other thing that happened is that um, if you just incubate very briefly, so you don't have enough time to load this dye into the, into the uh, subsacral animal cavity, you actually see a decrease in the signal. So it's kind of like a dilution of the, um, of the uh, density of the um, membrane when it's being in recruiting uh, unlabeled cavity. So, so in summary, we found that ventricular filling significantly acutely slows action potential propagation. That conduction slowing is not attributable uh, to or affected by um, stretch activated channel block blockade. It's uh, associated with elevated membrane capacitance in the whole heart and cultural myocytes. And that uh, ablation by disruption of CAD3 or treatment with methyl beta cyclodextrin inhibits the load in the conduction zone. And so acute physiological myocyte stretch slows conduction by recruiting cavioli to the sarcolemma and increasing membrane capacitance. What the potential pathophysiological or even physiological consequences of this, I don't know. Um, but I do want to end by um, just acknowledging something important here, which is cavioli are not just these uh, Plastic shape and vagination in the membranes. They are signal zones. They are they co-localize hundreds of molecules, 
uh, receptors, kinases, um, and ion channels. And um, in some cases, the scaffolding molecules interact with, by a protein-protein interaction directly with the ion channel, like there's that Cat3 um, uh, interaction with the L-type channel. Uh, in other cases, um, it's simply a co-localization or a, a concentration of the channel or the channel in its subunits or the channel in the subunits and um, signaling molecules that regulate them. So there's a lot more going on in cavioli than just folding and unfolding. And it makes you wonder what happens to these domains when these structures disappear. Um, and I don't know the answer to that, but I just did want to uh, acknowledge that and bring it up. And then just mention by way of sort of segueing gracefully out of this, um, since we haven't done this, but we actually have done a, a little bit of modeling on the electrophysiological effects of um, CAV3. We have one study on overexpressing CAV3, and another one I'll show you just very, very briefly, because I know time is running out, um, on uh, a LQT9 uh, CAV3 mutation. Um, and so, as you know, um, mutations in a whole variety of uh, LQT-associated uh, proteins mostly, but not all ion channels, um, are associated with increased active potential duration in EADs and uh, QT prolongation and increased risk of polymorphic V tank and Poisson. Although the mechanisms probably are quite different. And so one of the questions we were asked by um, some of our colleagues in um, Milwaukee was how can we help them interpret how the, this specific CAV3 mutation, F97C, uh, results in extra potential prolongation by doing some modeling. And so they had, they had one published study uh, in which they'd seen that um, this was by co-expressing either wild type or mutant CAV with um, the uh, sodium channel and um, making measurements in uh, HEC-293 cells, they found a gain of function of the late sodium current. Um, they found a, a loss of function of uh, the transient outward current and, um, and some change in the uh, activation kinetics. And then they also found no change in the current density or peak current for the l type current, but they did find a slowed uh, calcium-dependent inactivation of the l type current. And so this was relatively simple. We had, there was enough data, this I should acknowledge by the way from Tim Camp and Ravi Belichapali in um, Milwaukee is unpublished, um, or is under review. This uh, Ravi published earlier. Um, so we thought, well, what better model to use than the O'Hara Rudy human model? Uh, and Kevin Vincent in my lab uh, was able to modify this model. Um, he, he, you can see the action potential produced with the one hertz uh, pacing stimulus um, by increasing the late sodium current and decreasing the transient output current, slowing the calcium uh, dependent inactivation and matching all the uh, in vitro data in those expression systems that uh, they had measured in uh, at MCW. Um, and this, these weren't just changes in expression, there was changes in activation um, kinetics here. And so um, the action potential duration did in fact increase when we made all these changes. And uh, I think everyone was expecting that the changes in ITO would be responsible. Um, but actually, it turned out they weren't. Um, so this is just a slightly interesting part of this that you know, we continue to be impressed about the power of these models that particularly Yoram and colleagues have developed over the last 30 years to inform experimental electrophysiology, uh, especially when the measurements are being made in some expression system. And they don't know, you know, they can't measure these in the human biosite. So, um, even if they are, they're using IPS cell derived progenitors that don't behave like adult cells. So, um, but the power of particularly these human models are hard to underestimate. You can see here that the uh, all of the effect of the uh, almost all of the uh, effect of the prolongation of the action potential in the mutant 
could be explained by the slowed uh, inactivation kinetics of the LTAC channel. So obviously there's much more that we can and should do on this, but I just thought it would be a nice place to end just to acknowledge the obvious that um, mutations and loss of cavioli don't really affect the membrane capacity, but they affect uh, all kinds of things. And, and um, if we really want to model this systematically, we're going to have to uh, do a lot of work. So um, I think with that, I will stop and um, acknowledge you know, some of the original work that done on this was by Adam Wright did the uh, isolated hearts, and Emily Pfeiffer did the isolated myocyte work, and then Kevin did the models with uh, Tim and Ravi. Uh, and then um, you know, we had a lot of valuable help from collaborators. Uh, Andy Edwards, who was the first up in the labs now in Oslo, he did um, the uh, capacitance measurements. Um, Hamill Patel and Dave Roth developed the CAD3 knockout mice. Uh, Ingrid did the uh, EM. We did our first uh, optical mapping in cells at Hopkins with the West Tang and the student who did uh, his postdoc Rajesh. And then Fred Sachs gave us the DSM TX4. And I mentioned that Ravi Tim, and also Jan Schilling were involved in these uh, more recent studies, not only in the CAD3 Newton, but also a published study in the CAD3 over expressing mouse. So um, with that, um, thank you very much for your time and attention. We have time for a few questions because uh, Andrew is actually going back to the so, um, so you, 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 you increased the, um, the capacitance. So my understanding is that the, the cell memory becomes larger. You have more of the <coughs> surface surface uh, memory. Yeah. So there is nowhere in the world that the size of the cell increased sufficiently for the sort of protected area of the cell to explain this. Um, it's conceivable that the sort of total density of lipid could have increased, but I think that there's more to it than that. Uh, actually, if you notice the change in the dye uh, concentration, lipophilic dye concentration versus the capacitance was on the same order of sort of magnitude, but actually was less. Now, one of the things is that um, the, the cavioli are cholesterol enriched. So I think that part of what might be going on here is that the membrane is not only increasing its total amount of lipid, but it's also increasing its cholesterol fraction. And that actually changed the dielectric properties of the uh, membrane. And there are studies showing that cholesterol itself uh, in the membrane will um, increase membrane capacitance. So, Certainly the cells are not getting bigger by nearly enough to explain this by simply us stretching them. We're not changing the predicted area of the cell by very much. Um, I think we're adding quite a lot of lipid, but I'm not sure that that's simply increasing the bilayer surface area is sufficient to explain the capacitance. I think there must also be a dielectric effect. Well. Can you measure the, the string? Can you measure the force that the that the cell experiences during this, I mean, so you, of course you, you increase the volume you, and then you increase the membrane capacitance, so this is a contradictory uh, force that uh, actually is uh, affecting the force. Um, you know, it depends on the scale at which they're measuring that force. We can measure force in a single myocyte, um, but those forces aren't being transmitted through the membrane, so it's hard to know what the driving force for this is. Now, once the membrane becomes sort of unfolded, how to measure that membrane tension, I don't know. Last time I was here, I talked about vinculin and about the cortex and some measurements on how the cortical, using AFM, we were able to measure cortical tension. And that cortical tension seemed to coincide with the um, compression <coughs> of the lattice. And so when you have mutant mutation and knockout vinculin, actually the lattice expanded, and that was consistent with the change in membrane cortical tension. So if there's a measurement, that might be it. Um, but you'd have to do it in a stretch cell, I think. Um, and I don't know, that's, that's probably a doable measurement, actually, but I haven't tried it. Have you looked at the T-tobials? Not specifically. Um, one thing we were kind of pleased about was that the 
neonatal myocyte preparation does actually have sort of immature looking T-tubules. You can actually see things that look like T-tubules, which we weren't really expecting to see at all. Um, but I wouldn't be, I mean, a lot of mechanically sensitive channels seem to like to live inside T-tubules. Whether that protects them from or exposes them to particular strains is a little hard to say. Probably depends which strain. Um, so, you know. But it doesn't influence the memory capacity? It could easily. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would think it would have to fundamentally, yeah, right. but whether, it in, whether it, the presence of T-tubules changes the effect of strain in memory capacity, I don't know. Yeah. Does knocking out uh, Caviola affect the uh, Frank Starling relationship? Well, they do develop heart failure. We haven't measured mechanics in those mice, and I don't know that anyone has. Um, I don't expect it necessarily would, um, but until we measure it, I can say. Except, well, if you're changing now the net elasticity right. that's able to be pulled out, do you see changes in I, mean, the I don't think the elasticity of the membrane itself is very important as far as the mice and mechanics is concerned. The other way around is the strain of the myocyte that has a big effect on the membrane mechanics. So there are other, other mechanisms that come to mind. Mm -hmm. and I'm just throwing hypotheses at you. One of them is, for example, uh, gap junctions mm -hmm. and remodeling of gap junction. The half-life of a gap junction is half an hour. Yes. Yeah. So you said it's a fast change, gap junction. As we see here, we replace many, many, many of our gap junctions. So they stretch that could change. So this response happens in a minute. So I would think if it is gap junction, it would have to be some sort of regulation. It couldn't be turnover of gap junctions. And that was before we did this, before we did these measurements of this space and time constant, that's where I was fully expected to go with this, um, was in to look at the effect of gap junctions. But actually, it, you know, this, these, and you saw that the space constant did change. So I think there is some regulation of junctional coupling. Well, one, one, one way to see if it's gap junction, the effect of gap junction probably would be very, so you can right. look at the effect in yeah. different directions and see if it's not constant, then I would sus be more suspicious of it. Well, it, as you saw, it actually was not anisotropic, and that was the other thing. We were doing that experiment with the hope of seeing that it was highly anisotropic, and, and it, it wasn't. But still, you know, there's that, there's that actually significant increase that we saw for low strains, less than 5%, where we probably aren't... Um, unfolding the membrane and therefore maybe aren't recruiting cavioli. And so it could be that that's that early stage was where you would see the effect of this regulation of the gap junctions. Um, so the other, I'd the like other, to do the that. The other sorry. thing is the uh, T-tubules. Mm -hmm. right. right. What happens yes. to the T-tubules yeah. when you stretch? Yeah. And that goes together with calcium dependency yes. activation of the LTAC calcium channels. Mm -hmm. So Frank so that's Sachs, another uh, candidate. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Frank Saxa has done some really nice experiments uh, looking at the definition of the T-tubules and strain. So <coughs> one interesting thought might be, since there are less T-tubules in the atria and more caviola, what is the differential yeah, response? Yeah. Or use you know cells that don't have T-tubules. And yeah, well, I, I mean, I think largely I mean, my sets don't have. T I mean, I think it's sort of a fortunate thing that we found them. So I don't think the T-tubules are intrinsic. But I think the actual uh, yeah, more cavioli, and I think that um, potentially that conduction slowing there could be in a more important uh, arrhythmia substrate um, than in the ventricles. And, and, and they don't have T2. Right. And they have elevated dicyte versus heart rate. So that could help to dissect, you know, which one of those. So my question is the mouse, the cavioli three knockout mouse is normal or not? It's not normal as they get older. But um, when they're young, they don't have any uh, failing phenotype. So this is something and I think. The is normal in adult Yes, mouse. yeah. Oh, well, depends what you mean by adult. As they get older, they start to have um, some abnormalities. But most of the, most of the studies have focused on the cardiomyopathies. So, so if I understand, you stretch the membrane and then you flatten out the cavioli and that recruits more. Mm -hmm. You release that, that Stretching, did the ones that were there snap back? They reassemble, yeah. So that's the, I mean, of course this is all indirect, but that's the interpretation of what's, what we're seeing in the EMs and in the experiments. So, so you, you just get more than, yeah. you, you don't replace the ones that were there. You, 
Yeah. Well, I presume you're turning them over. I mean, I think they're very dynamic. So I think you're. Yeah, I guess that's something. Yeah. That yeah. yeah. I mean, we can't. We can't prove that, but that to me, I mean, given the way cavioli. So, so uh, then, do you see more tortuosity when you snap it? Yeah. No. No. Occasionally, we do see some overshoot in the number of cavioli. But actually afterwards you actually see okay. them, a few minutes afterwards you actually see more of them just afterwards. Well thank you all very hey. much. I appreciate you coming thank in you. along at the non-standard time. <laughs>